on the topic of reading, because I know even in your YouTube uh, this bio description, you describe yourself as a bibliophile. Um, how incurable? <laughs> I, 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 incurable. Yeah, I, I can a self confess incurable bibliophile is the technical definition of my condition. Yeah. <laughs> in other words, I can't stop reading. So I just reading and reading. And reading. I read. I read. Yeah. Um, I heard something recently that kind of. Because in the kind of self-development space, there's a lot of this stuff about optimization of reading and listen to something on mm. 2x speed and 3x speed and you can mm. speed read and all the rest of it. Um, but there was um, an author who said that... Oh so I, I, I really didn't like any of this, but anyway, yeah, carry on. So there was, not... there was an author who said that even if you're the most prolific of readers, there's only, let's say, a few thousand books that you're going to read in your lifetime. Um, the amount of books probably won't feel like a small library. Um, so you have to be somewhat selective in how you choose yeah. which books to read. And I was considering yeah. how do you at this stage um, kind of, um, are you still guided by your interests or recommendations? How do you choose which books to read? And do you read oh, them? Do you read them in a way where I know some people have this thing where they, if they open a book, they have to finish it page by page, and other people have this method of just skimming whatever gem sticks and like not being, being using the book in that way rather than being like I have to read each page by page and finish the book. So, what's your approach? I'm probably not a good person to ask because I don't really have any. I, I know Sheikh Hamza Yusuf has is this course or whatever yeah uh, how to read i saw book. that yeah a structured uh you know reflected educated way this is how you know and i don't have any of that unfortunately so i'm probably not a good person to ask i might lead people astray because <laughs> i don't have that I'm, I'm driven by my own my own nafs really it's like what do i want to read you know this is really is what it is it just happens to be that my reading is quite eclectic um uh, I mean, I could give, I've got some examples here. I, I put them here before we started about what I'm currently reading and just explain to you the different kinds of reading that I do. Because um, I'm reading this book at the moment. Um, uh, it's a French book uh, originally. It's called, um, well, it's by, by my, Marcel Proust. And one of the English translation is in remembrance of, of things past or time lost, depending on how translated. And um, this is a great, great novel written uh, in the early 20th century, uh, probably the greatest novel of the 20th century. And this is the first installment, Swan's Way, and you see it's quite thick. But the, the point of me reading this is that a lot of people say, and they're absolutely right, if you read this book in translation or in the original French, is that you read it slowly because the uh, Marcel Proust uh, has a whole worldview where you just really need to immerse yourself in it and take your time uh, and just go through it. And um, it's very, well, some of it is quite stream of consciousness stuff. Um, but once you kind of get involved in his mind and his way of thinking, it's the most extraordinary book. It's, it's probably the greatest novel of the 20th century. Um, you don't put this on 2x, you don't speed through it because you will not, you will destroy the delicate French aroma. You know, this is, it's meant to be savored and not, you know, bulldozed through. So that's one example. Um, another book I'm reading, a uh, completely different subject, um, Sultan Abdul Hamid II, the, the, the last great Ottoman um, Sultan. Uh, this is a translation, uh, and this is a history of obviously this guy, um, because I'm quite interested in the Ottoman uh, Empire. Um, another book I'm reading by one of my former guests, um, Dale Allison, he's a professor at uh, of uh, Princeton University, one of the most distinguished universities in the States, is an extremely brilliant man. Um, and this has just been published, Encountering Mystery, Religious Experience in a Secular Age. And uh, he's talking about all sorts of things like near-death experiences or people who think they've seen ghosts or people who've had amazing experiences of or God or, um, or experiences of evil. He talks about those who've experienced an evil presence in their room or uh, and, and so on and so on. And it's the most extraordinary book because um, it's talking about religious experience in, in the West at a time when official religion is uh, in many countries, you know, virtually extinct. Mm. And yet beneath the surface, uh, many, many people, millions of people, uh, according to reports and studies, have very vivid and life-changing religious experiences, which are not connected to organized religion. 
And this book, which had literally been published a few weeks ago, is a very readable um, and daring book in a way because he's exploring this kind of underworld of experiences. Um, now it's very, uh, he doesn't really talk about Muslim experiences or Christian experiences, mm. but I think it, it's fascinating. Uh, 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 anyway, so I'm reading that one. That's great fun. Um, but I, I'm reading other books. I tend to read about five or six books at the same time. And depending mm. on the kind of book it is, so the, the, this one reads slowly. This one I can read fairly fast. And this one, because of the author, and he's just so amazing. I just, I just enjoy reading. He's so, he's so good with words and expressions and the way he has insights into psychology, human experience are very uh, intelligent and non-judgmental. And so I, I kind of savor that book. It's not something I feel I have to plow through mm. to get to the end. Um, but, but my academic works, I, I will be much more um, systematic and read them through, even if I don't like them or find them interesting uh, or juicy, I will, because I have an objective, which is to understand the whole contents, I will push myself it's like when you're jogging or you're running, you're, oh, I'm too tired. And you just put, no, you keep on running, you keep on pushing it because you know, you've got a goal. And that's how I do. That's how I do it with some of the more academic books, which I'm quite demanding actually, mm. because I'm not, I'm not, if I, if I do it just on the basis of, of what well, am I enjoying this book, mm. I'm not going to finish because I'm going to get bored after an hour or whatever. Mm. So I have different strategies depending on the, the genre of book I'm reading. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great, that's exactly what I was wanting to hear in terms of like your insights and how you, your process essentially. What about the issue of recall in terms of like m remembering some of the stuff that you read as in, does that pain you sometimes mm. to think that the things that you read, there's certain things that will just intuitively stick out to you and perhaps like register in your brain for whatever reason um depending on various different factors i guess but other than that do you have a system um for remembering or note taking and things like that oh, yeah oh note taking yeah i i i do use um barrows and uh i've got you know I've got, uh, yellow markers or whatever uh absolutely uh that's quite important um i think remembering i i i actually find myself a great way to remember things i've discovered and this is a commonplace has often been observed in people is if you explain, you know, if I'm reading a, a, a book, say, on the historical understanding of the Gospels in the New Testament, uh, a great way to remember it is to explain what I've just read to someone else. Mm. So just talk to them about but I, this book, you know, what is reduction criticism? What, what is Christology? What is uh, textual? And actually explain these concepts to another person verbally, um, sometimes in discussion, sometimes even in debate. And then it really helps to clarify and embed what I've read in a way, uh, uh, the alternative is just within my own mind, kind of almost like a, a solipsistic experience, just within my own experience. And then it tends to stick far less. So actually talking about it with someone else helps to really, um, make it a part of the intellectual furniture. And so I, I I've done that with some books so many times now that I kind of walk around with this apparatus and I know that I just, you know, it's quite dangerous in a way because particularly at speaker's corner in debate. You know, I know I can just deploy this, you know, and it's quite, it can be if it's weaponized, which is not good. If it was weaponized, it could be quite dangerous. It can be quite, you know, you can really cut down argument, but it can be quite lethal. By lethal, I mean, the arguments are so powerful and they're so intellectually acute, that, but you don't, if, you, if you're debating somebody, you don't want to devastate them. You want to bring them on board. So you've got to be careful how you deploy this information because it can be very, um, subversive of their world, you know, mm. if they have certain ideas, if they're fundamentalists, for example, so one has to be careful to deploy this knowledge in a sensitive way, rather than just using it as a weapon to beat them because it's powerful stuff. Um, so, you know, there, there's w w with knowledge comes responsibility, you know, you, you, one can't just deploy it. One has to be careful how, how one does it. And I've made lots of mistakes in this area when I have used w uh, knowledge perhaps inappropriately, uh, picking at speaker's corner, of course. Yeah. Uh, and that's not, 